Uh, I would like my POIs to be strictly in the chat. Just give me a few seconds. Also, I am audible and visible, right? Okay, yeah. So if you do have any kind of gender pronoun preferences and you want to declare that, you can do that at the beginning um, of your speech. I don't have any um, pronoun preference. Okay, starting my speech in three, two, one. In the late 40s, 1984 was released. 30 years down the line, people were desensitized to a point that there wasn't sufficient hope to say that a better government than the Thatcher government could exist. A bit of characterization then onto my arguments. Firstly, political fiction describes a vision of the world and how it is governed. It gives a what is the direct message here is that it gives what the nature of law is and the nature in which these laws are going to be reinforced. There's also usually some subtext as to what's going on right now in the world. When the 1984 was released, it was released in ante anticipation of the tyrannical direction Western democracies were leading to. What does optimism look like? It looks like protagonist being the winner, moral victory being with the protagonist and justice prevailing. We think that pop culture has a major influence in terms of outcome and understanding our place in the world. To win this debate, we need to show that positive politi political fiction is better in terms of the uh, consumption. The positive political fiction doesn't mean that your movie is entirely cherry on the top, but it means that your usual arc of world building resolution it's still existent but you still feel like stuff like uh, sexual violence and stuff like that it just means that the conclusion of the movie is positive or it's hopeful realize that there is like enough anger and pessimism in this status quo to drive you to a social movement it's the lived reality of the people stories of friend and all of this means that movies do not really make a significant impact in terms of anger and pessim pessimism Two arguments then. Firstly, on why the influence of positive political fiction is better in terms of outcomes for consumers. And secondly, on why the narrative set for entire community of the people is likely to be, be better on our side of the house. A, gen first argument. Generally, you make a movie in the anticipation of result. The message on either side is to drive people towards success. This is only created when there is positive message revolving around the movie. It influences the transitional, transitional justice. But B, we create an environment of optimism and we think that's really better. The premise here is that optimism is something that's good in terms of people who are fighting for change in the status quo. The mechanism here is that you always see yourself as the protagonist when you're the consumer of their media. Protagonists like are the real people which you reflect yourself to. That's how movie and stories are written because you want to show some form of relativity between the consumers and the protagonist and the characters of the movie. When the protagonist of that movie or political fiction achieves success, you feel as though it's a victory for yourself when you consume the media. It motivates you in terms of saying that there is a better outcome and a ray of hope. This hope is accessible in terms of relative characters being able to get this success, being able to get this win. The comparison here is that they lose the sense of hope and trust in the justice system in their side of the house. Why is this important then? A, the current, in the current political climate, when you are an activist, you're likely to face activism burnout. This means that people who are, are stopping to get leisure time on social movement because you're burnt out. People are generally less involved in social uh, movement because of the pessimistic narrative that exists around social movement and how the success from social movement cannot be derived. This pessimistic narrative exists too much in the status quo. That's why you're likely as an activist to face that activism burnout. But secondly, the media portrays like it sensationalizes people who lose hope. This looks like media portraying the death of an environmental uh, environmentalist in a social movement. This also looks like media portraying the loss of the uh, media portraying the um, failure of a movement or media portraying the problems within the movement in the status quo. But then see, the current narrative in the society is that everything is nihilistic because there's also a large movement in younger generation that they glamorize things like nihilism and complain, but don't go out and actively involve in movements because they don't have hope. They feel that they can't make a change. And these people, these nihilistic younger generation people, 
when they read these sort of political fiction, they're more, more likely to get pessimistic after reading that content. Why do we change this in our side of the house? A, in our side, you get the euphoria of hope, which means that you're willing to act in the movement. You're willing to commit to rallies in the heat of optimism that you get after reading that political fiction or after watching that politi fiction, political fiction. But then B, there's a general dilution of the nihilist, uh, nihilist people or the nihilism in general, because this political fiction shows that there's a solvency of the issues. There's a greater success in the social media, social movement. And all of this means that the nihilism that these younger generation have is greatly reduced. But then see, you have a sense of escapism when you're burnt out. You see these books, you see these movies, and you know that, oh, there are some, like, there are some instances where justice is prevailing, that justice can prevail. You get more hope. And even if you read this, like you have to read this, like when your psyche of not having a solvency gets re reinstated even more. That, that happens in their side of the house where all these consume and all they see are pessimistic content. But, um, but um, D, we solve this because there's a definite sense of uh, achievement with protagonists getting more success in our side of the house. Why this hope and the general psyche of the people being motivated even better and important in our side of the house? Because you get more motivation to continue your effort, even though your efforts are futile, because this fiction gives you more hope that justice is reliable. It validates your effort in so far as you'll achieve a success. And even if the system is unjust, there's still like going to continue their fight for their right in the hopes of getting some form of success in the hopes of changing their lives. I'll take a few eye. Activism often takes generations. If hope is tied to tangible outcomes, time and time again after failure, why is hope likely going to prevail in all instances? Because like when you're surrounded only by pessimistic narratives, you're less likely to even um, go into activism. You're less likely to um, fight for the justice or you're less likely to like fight for your own rights. But the point in time when you have some form of content that gives you hope, it's like likely for you to uh, get some form of like, I don't know, you are getting some form of uh, hope to continue, moti continue being motivated for that movement. But second, the narrative set for entire communities of people is likely to be on better in our side of the house because unlike the first argument, the broad implication of movies having political implication is that they affect entire community of the people. This looks like Black Panther being influential and Gongo by influencing the feminist movement. If we can show that positive political fiction on net betters the binding of the community, then we're still better off than uh, side opposition. A, notice that the side of common enemy is not lost in either side. Even in our side, the media still portrays the struggle against system. It uh, still portrays the struggle against the villains. We're also likely to have more emotionally char charged narratives set in terms of these antagonists. This looks like man being out to get you, the big brother setting a tyrannical government. The only difference is who wins this. We're likely to win this. Very proud to propose. Okay, if all judges are ready, um, we'll be moving on. Hi, can I be heard? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, just a moment. Thank you so much. Mai, ready to move on? Thank you so much. Okay, uh, we thank a very fine speech by Prime Minister. Now let's move on to leader of opposition to open up opposition's case. Here, here. All right. Uh, POI preferences. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I use sheer pronouns and I'll take my POIs verbally, please. Thank you. Okay, starting my speech in three, two, 
one. The state is society's singularly most powerful actor in having apparatuses with the capacity to shape entire populations. On opposition, we believe it is impossible to be too careful when we hold the liberty of millions in our hands, and it's only on opposition do we represent what the state could become. Our stance is two things. One, we prefer the majority of negative and pessimistic representations, which looks like two main things. A, the context is usually very overwhelming odds of usually dystopian governments and an overreach of state power. Power. And B, these main characters usually fail in their endeavor to overcome the political obstacles or they are back to square one. Secondly, a positive representation means there's an overwhelmingly good governmental system and proposition then cannot support presentations of predominantly bad political actions, i.e. as first proposition asserts that there will be representation of sexual violence or other harmful actions because the overall message will definitely still be the positivity. If it is so visceral on proposition, so viscerally abusive, then people will still remember only the most horrible actions and they won't be able to take a message of hope out of that film. But specifically, I think Proposition crucially misses a huge part of what political fiction actually looks like. Because part of political fiction, i.e. West Wing, which existed in the info slide, humanizes governments as ones they are trying their best and who, when they fail, it's not because they are malevolent or they are oppressive, but it's just because they cannot do their best. And we think that it's inherently oppressive and harmful to the most vulnerable. But before I talk about two arguments from opposition, let's deal with the case from Proposition in three ways. Number one, on their mechanism. They try to say in their mechanism that there's enough anger in status quo, so films and media don't make that big of an impact. Three things to say here. Number one, this is a contradiction because their first argument tells you that the films are going to be so influential that activist burnout is going to happen on a mass scale and they are going to give up on their literal livelihoods. I think we have to characterize what activists are because activists fight for their lives. Proposition is telling us that movies are so uninfluential and yet somehow so powerful that activists choose to give up on their livelihoods just because they watched a movie. We think that's a contradiction that cannot stand. But secondly, when they tell you in your first argument that you relate to the protagonist, that is exactly why they are influential and why you will be able to take crucial messaging from it. Why is this contradiction crucial? Because we think that is the concession that these films innately encourage anger. And we think that anger and that urgency exclusively exist under our side of the house. We're going to prove in arguments why this is important when it comes to holding the state accountable. On their first argument then, about how this creates better outcomes for consumers. That's what they tell you, but I think they don't actually benefit society as a whole. They're only talking about very specific social movements that don't actually, like they don't even prove the outcomes in those instances. The only impact they give to you under this argument is activist burnout. People then lose sense of hope and trust in the justice system. Three things to say here. Number one, I think we need to criticize the framework of justice to begin with, and it is not enough to believe in the justice system and think that everything will end up well. The problem with status quo is that it is imperfect and that it's on the trend towards negative Negativity, and we need to represent that in political fiction. But secondly, I think the loss of hope in the loss of hope in these films are indirectly like is directly like these films are set in the future, right? So crucially, political fiction doesn't display the hopelessness of the present. They display a hopelessness of the future where society has like degraded so terribly that there is no more way out. Op opposition crucially says that we are at a turning point and this is where you must act now. That is the importance of political fiction, right. incentivizing people to be hopeful for today. But thirdly, I think hope is not the underpinning of social movements. It is about survival, which means that is their foremost incentive. But also we think hope is very fragile Hope is contingent on positive outcomes to continually refresh that hope because hope cannot last forever. Insofar as proposition concedes that social movements and social change takes a very long time, their hope is unsustainable and they don't actually benefit individuals. Before I go on to my arguments, I will gladly take that point. On both sides, there are enough sources of anger, such as news media and things as such. On our side, we have some balance in terms of bringing about hope on your side that is lost. Why is this not a good thing on our side? I think it's also unclear why hope is not mutually exclusive. Like there is things like past precedents or like future, like or like thoughts about the future that still make you hopeful. But that actually takes me nicely into my first argument about why uniquely political fiction empowers all of these skepticisms. The first argument then about how we empower the skepticism of the state that is crucial to a healthy government. Three parts. Number one, I think pessimistic political fiction is the most effective political caricature, which hyperbolizes the obvious, deepest evil of our governmental structures, illustrating the possibility of corrupting the very 
very morality of the structures of our states. This is crucial to impacting the negativity because this opens up a worldview of the ugliest possibilities of humanity. Why is this unique? Two things, because the unique nature of political fiction, absent of all other political advocacy, is that it's not only apolitical, so it is not bipartisan, but also because it's especially crucial for the most disengaged political actors who usually take for granted their human rights, that the state is going to always respect my humanity. And this is crucial because we break the bubble of privilege by depicting a relatable protagonist compared with visceral outcomes. And we show you that your life isn't always going to be perfect. And this is why you must take action now. Status quo, we have voter tampering in literal Western liberal democracies, where people engaging with messing up the Supreme Court in Poland, for example. There is very little and despite all of these harmful status quo action, there's very little actor to there's very little action made to strengthen democratic structures. That clearly, even though you can see the action, there's a disconnect that you don't see what could possibly happen, given that this is only the first step in many of state oppression. Political fiction worldviews the process to devolving into a system of pessimism, i.e. 1984 was perfectly fine prior to the book's beginning, but it warned of the importance of post-war nationalism. It told you that if you believe too much in government structures and the media, that is where you devolve into a system where you no longer are able to have autonomy. We crucially remind people of the autonomy in the turning point only on off position. Secondly, we think we give individuals the hindsight to be able to recognize early warning signs of oppression and backsliding. Why doesn't this happen on opposition? Two reasons. Number one, because of optimism bias. We think you are living your current life now and you can see the mature quality of life that you're living is good. Therefore, you think this will not happen to you or that this will only happen in the most extreme instances, not realizing that this is the first step of many to lead to the extreme instances. But secondly, there's a difficulty in conceptualizing what the repercussions of certain actions entail, i.e. a government can oppress you, but the visceral depictions of your right literally being stripped from you, you not being able to walk to and from work without being afraid that somebody is watching you and tracking your thoughts, that is what we're able to push under our side of the house. Lastly, then, this creates the important necessary sense of urgency for mobilization for two reasons. One, because we're telling you this is a point of no return. In positivity, you say that this harmful state system is only a bypass. You pass this phase and you're going to lead to freedom again because freedom is the end goal that, upward, that prop would like you to take away. We tell you this is the only chance for you to mobilize mobilize, you cannot act again, so you must be urgent now. But secondly, we improve the sense of self-preservation because these are the only ways that we're able to empower the urgency. This empowers political literacy and we are better able to criticize the state. The second argument about how we produce a society that forgives states failures on proposition, we think we're going to engage with a range of representation of what positive political fiction looks like. And DPM must come up and tell us why this happens on their side as well. They can't just defend Fahrenheit 451. Two options here. Number one, you're very positive in your outlook of governmental structures, like we told you in setup, like West Wing. This is inherently bad because it relies on the benevolence of government in three ways. Number one, we think they have perverse political incentives, so they're not going to be nice to you. Secondly, they're industrial lobbies that inherently self-incentivize. But lastly, we think the state has too much power and therefore you must err on the side of caution. They can mobilize the military and media, but proposition gives imperfect government systems too much credit that the government members are trying their best. They're just human. Then not everybody can benefit under a democracy, all of it as an excuse for marginalizing individuals. That doesn't happen under our side. But secondly, if you're talking about the context first prop gave you, i.e. bad structures where you can overcome them, we still think that it's inherently harmful. The state will always be slated against you. If you're a minority, you will always be oppressed. Only opposition presents the reality of the world.
Oh, uh, should I start now? Oh yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I was waiting for Maya because I can see Martin is ready and uh, Jacob is ready to move on as well. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, we thank Elo for a very fine speech. Now let's move on to DPM. Here, here. Your chat preferences as well. Thank you. Yeah, my PR preference is to chat just to figure it out. Just give me a few seconds. Is everything fine? Oh, yeah. I think our internet like died out for a quick second. Um, did the speaker already start? We're so sorry if they did. No, oh, it's okay. no, no. I think the re recording has already resumed. Yeah. Um, okay. Starting in three, two, one. We live in a world where nihilism is something that's a popular rhetoric to a massive extent. Side opposition literally forgets or probably does not strategically engage with this point, specifically when this is one of the major things that people normally use in society because of the pop culture are facing a lot. We don't see why hopelessness is something that, uh, that you know, they're constantly trying to disagree with. I'll be doing three things in my speech. Firstly, I'll be providing a direct response to what they said in their speech. Secondly, I'll be talking about hope and the solidarity in general. Thirdly, I'll be providing an extension on how political incentives change, why that's important. So firstly, on direct responses. So firstly, they talk, uh, talk about this uh, visceral, uh, they talk about how our world is not like East, specifically when the end goal is something that's like uh, that's that's like painting a good picture of the world. We think that's not true, specifically in instances where, you know, the visceral, uh, the, you know, victory that comes after the visceralness is something that's largely portrayed. This is to say that even in the David and Goliath example, they, uh, like the monstering, a monsterness of Goliath is something that people generally remember, even when you know David won at the end of the day. We think that the villains are uh, the villains are villains are likely going to even be uh, like noticed even in instances when they're not true. But secondly, under their idea of like anger and like the entire point of urgency and things like such, we tell you why this anger is going to be largely symmetric on both sides, specifically because of the large overarching narrative in society, which includes such as a news media second live experience of people but thirdly they're also activists who are actively incentivized to actually work for things like you know movements or probably urgent issues that are the problems in the modern day society if any problems exist in society they're necessarily going to be talked about we don't see how it's not going to be talked about at all in their world but even when even when in these instances are also Let's see what the distinction really lies, right? The distinction lies in the point of optimism, specifically filled in a world that is inherently nihilistic when people are A, believing that the world is hopeless and things as such. We think that uh, we think that there is an overarching, you know, narrative that covers there is a massive amount of hopelessness. Hopelessness means there is a lesser motivation to learn or work and things as such in general. We think that this lesser form of motivation is worse off, right? But they say, oh, the hope is something that's, you know, that's not going to last forever and things as such, right? Um, we, what we need to understand then is that what, like, what prompts immediate outcomes from individual is something that's hope. So if you're hopeful right today, you would want to do something right now. And these sort of small, small instances are equally important in society uh, to an extent when to an extent when you are able to actually bring urgent changes in societies in general. We think that these people are likely to inherit. But even if they say, oh, hope is something that's like not going to last forever, we don't see how that that how the change actually occurs on their side, specifically when people are hopeless, when they have no any motivation to actually learn or grow more in general. But thirdly, on the idea of how 
uh, the governments are imperfect and you know they are trying their best we think that's not necessarily true because because like all the governments and the politicians within governments have a lot of incentives to focus on personal interests they're not necessarily working for like people in general we see corruptions happening scandals happening even like us which is like one of the liberal democracies still has instances where politicians are doing wrong things and doing necessarily harmful things in society which means that they're not trying their best in and of itself but but secondly we think that even in those cases where you know there is like this great uh, this privilege bubble or things as such we think that this privilege bubble needs to be broken in a sense that these people need to realize and take the responsibility for it they're only able to take a responsibility when they can when they won't get away by saying oh it it is something that is probably not able to create as much impact and things as such in general we think that's massively important on our side but secondly under this idea of like solidarity that abba points out right we think that friction binds people in groups and that's necessarily very important why, why is the community in general then better off on our side firstly the sight of common enemy is not not lost at all even in our media we we do portray struggle against systems villains and things as such but secondly the reason we're better off is that a positive outcome implies that being part of the group is something that's extremely meaningful towards individual but thirdly proletarian writers wrote work in order to lift work worker of some inspiring them to accept hope of social change this revolution came about and it was able to generate a communist region how the communist regime turned out isn't our fault but the fact that they were moved in such a way that they brought this regime is more important but fourthly bickering and fighting not in terms of what they want uh, to do about the problem but whether they should address uh, is extremely important right this looks like ghetto being distrustful of systematic change people thinking that there is no resolution to crime and things as such they need to defend all this under their side before i move on i'll take that view right so hope thinks hope means you think your future will eventually shape out to benefit you eventually so why won't society just tie out the bad administrations of corruption especially since you say social change is so hard because so why won't people just in your future because there are nuances that you say that the end result is not a direct outcome but uh, but but it is a form of saying that you get out after the you know disadvantage that you have gotten but moreover the hope acts as an agency to actually bring changes for people in a hopeless world we don't see how the agency actually works out for people to work actually harder thirdly then on how political incentives change in general the premise here is oftentimes politicians use the existing narrative to weaponize the inaction of others then promoting their own action this looks like the biden uh, the biden government winning the election just based on the fact that trump is bad this is this is something that democrats have been doing historically right but the the mechanism of political change then on our side becomes that first at any point in time optimism becomes a norm narrative in society that's overarching escaping the worst is not necessarily a priority uh, a priority secondly then what becomes the priority right the priority becomes challenging politicians to bring positive change that are likely and possible now the change is not something that's unrealistic or something out of the way that they are trying to portray under their world it's something that's realistic it's something that that's achievable so even if they don't like reach to the maximum amount of change they're at least able to make something impactful or reach around it that's extremely important but thirdly the, this particular argument is independent of of, of opposition saying that the portrayal of political fiction is unrealistic this demands change leading to marginal form of concessions by politicians which is largely essential in the present world in general the importance then becomes firstly merit which a uh, people uh, where, which in which like people are able to win election in the form of meritocracy they focus more on electoral debates manifestos that's more focused on positive action rather than the inaction of another which is massively important on our world but secondly the perception of evil is also uh, is also something that's like very high right so that's when we're able to reduce the sort of uh, the sort of negative connotations that's generally attached to it we think that we are better able to uh, then like counter their point on how benevolent leader and government exists and things as such we don't think that they are that's the like right portrayal of people we don't think that's how people should perceive these people uh, these like governments in general specifically when governments are working in inactions in the state 
status quo. For all those reasons, we're very proud to stand on proposition. Okay. We thank DPM for a very fine speech. Now let's move on to DLO, starting opposition, uh, continuous opposition's case. Here, here. Hi, can I double check that I'm audible? Clear and loud. Thank you very much. Great. Um, I'll take POIs verbally, so just unmute yourself. Setting up a timer. Starting in three, two, one. Panel, an emotion that is far stronger than hope is fear. Because hope is fleeting and hope is abstract. The hope that proposition argued for is tied in outcome. That only once we achieve and see that something is possible, can we hope for it. Often hope is only derived when we think that there is the possibility of change or else the hope is not enough to actually counteract the impossible scenario. On opposition, we're very clear that do we even know number one, what are these structures within the political scene that we need to call out? And can we conceptualize a state to be that malevolent in the first place? But secondly, do we have the heightened sense of fear to act that currently exists to want to ensure that the outcome never manifests in the first place? Because on proposition, they tell you that even in the worst scenarios in, the society, in society and in status quo, you can always change the structure. What opposition tells you is that society cannot afford for the devolution of political structures because there's the possibility of no return. We told you that was a far greater mobilizer when you realize that you need political literacy in the now because if you don't educate yourself, the outcomes are going to be cemented. Before I move on to a new piece of argumentation as to how the political dystopia applies to all and dis disables the privileged from insulating themselves from participation, a few levels of responses, observations, and rebuilding of the first opposition case. The first thing I would like to point out is how contradictory and how the tension in proposition's case is still unresolved, even after the point out from first opposition. What is the contradiction inherently? They want to argue on our side, on their side, sorry, that there exists a sufficient level of anger and mobilization currently, which is why we don't require the negativity. I think just for the purposes of having a clean debate, proposition is being far too strategic in wanting to co-op both sides of the aisle. They want to have their hope, but they also want to have levels of anger and pessimism on their side. Here's why it can't work. Because if we have such strong, negative, and pessimistic individuals in society, then their benefits of hope is extremely minimal in trying to counteract existing biases. But second, and more importantly, can only occur if a majority of people are able to overcome the negative biases. So what proposition's burden now has to be is proving to me why the consumption of political fiction is going to change the minds of the currently hedonistic, nihilistic individuals within society society or else that means they cannot achieve any of their outcomes if people don't actually change their minds which means proposition has two things they need to do right. their, but it's likely going to be too late either number one they need to concede that they can't have the best of both worlds and need to argue that their side lucky is going to overwhelm and overshadow ne the negativity and therefore only have the positive narratives as the majoritarian view which means that they have to concede the harms that we propose from first opposition in the first and second argument to its fullest extent rather than the um, catch all response in second prop 
that they use, or second, that if they want to still string along on the idea that there is negativity on their side, you cannot credit any of their case to the fullest extent, given number one, the benefits therefore are watered down in terms of it counteracting the positivity, but number two, they still have not proven to you why individuals would pivot if nihilism and the idea that her life is meaningless is far too strong. That rebuttal is extremely important. I would like you to take note of it and hold the third speaker accountable in their speech. But on to actual responses. Number one, on the idea of hope for advocacy, because I think it sufficiently responded to you in first opposition, but it did not actually want to pay attention and just asserted that we did not. Here's the nuanced rebuttals, therefore. We told you why hope that keeps you going cannot be the metric because it is inherently tied to optimistic outcomes. We questioned them from first opposition. What happens when you're unable to achieve set outcomes? Because I think the problem with proposition is they don't mechanize and illustrate how any of their benefits are able to materialize. They just say that there's optimism and therefore people push. We argued what happens in between between is what is important and crucial for how their argument actually plays out. We said, and they consider in second proposition, by the way, when they use the exact terms that you have optimism based on outcome, that the problem with that is that often activism trying to uproot and change political structures is not something that happens overnight, often takes generations, if not decades, and if not in the status quo, is still problematic, which is why when you tie it based on outcomes, the thing that we said crucially in nuance was that hope can potentially be fleeting, that hope does not sustain you indefinitely, and you need to be able to see the gains and the wins, but if you tie it to large political outcomes and large structural changes, the point at which you're unable to achieve this, propositions hope disappears and dissipates and activist burnout actually occurs more on their side. But second, let's assume their best case, assuming that you did have the push in the short term in order to do this. What was the thing that we told you on opposition? Number one, we explained to you that hope was never needed to initially mobilize these individuals, given oppression and survivability were tangible reasons enough to fight and to advocate for yourself. But secondly, that on our side, when it's not out come base, you're able to better take these small wins in order to prevent things like activist burnout. So in, for example, African Americans, it does not require us to restructure a corrupt internalized system, but rather being able to vote one day, being able to send your children to school are things that can keep you going. You cannot allow feelings and things like hope to decide advocacy. It needs to be your current circumstances that continuously push you. But secondly, on the nuance as to why they can't have the cake and they can't have their cake and eat it too. We gave you the nuance they want, did not want to engage, they just say that individuals are not um, individuals are still able to see the overwhelmingly positive outcome. The nuance was this, that there is a limit to how large the political obstacle on proposition can be within their political fiction. Because if the story is, for example, one person single-handedly being able to overthrow an autocratic government, no one can buy into that, which is why the structure and the obstacle needs to be lowered in order for the optimism to trump and try um, to overcome in the end, because individuals need to see that there's a pathway for me being able to emulate said actions, which is why they could not actually co-opt our case. But lastly, on nihilism, they said we never strategically engaged. We told you why it did not even matter in this debate. They had to explain first that, that we put out in the first, um, at the top of the speech, how they changed nihilists. But second, and very easily, a nihilist doesn't want to die. In terms of nihilists choose to live every day, that even if you believe life is meaningless, you also believe that you can feel pain and would not like to live under state oppression. Before I'm one sure. If it is the case that you get absolutely no changes structurally over like 10, 20, 30 years, then this debate does not make any difference. The realistic case is that you do get some concessions in terms of solidifying hope in the real world. Yeah, we said you get small concessions. We agree. You require the large political outcomes. And saying that advocacy does not take decades is just disingenuous. Look how long women took to be able to have the right to vote. On to the third argumentation argumentation then as to how political dystopia applies to all individuals and does not allow the privilege to insulate themselves. The problem in status quo is that people who hold the most social power aren't always the critiquers of the state and aren't actually politically participants. Because even when there are real world politics that are toxic and problematic, the privileged are the individuals that are able to insulate themselves from that harm. So often narratives of positivity and optimism never really apply to these individuals because they are able to shield themselves from the necessary harms that the state is propagating. 
everything. But second and crucially, only pessimism and negativity would affect the upper echelons of society because positive and optimism are able to be shielded and require people to live under a, a position and a condition where they feel defenseless and have no power. Hence, on our side, when we say that these structures are inherently going to discriminate all individuals, when you conceptualize the world as one that can also be distasteful to yourself, do we mobilize the most influential of individuals to be politically participants? Note, panel, that we live in a world where the state literally engineered our choices in Cambridge Analytica. Only under negativity and pessimism can we conceptualize such a malevolent state and take preemptive measures against that. On proposition, they would hope that the state is benevolent and pray to gods. Hi, just let me know when to start. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think you're good to go. Oh, okay. I was hoping to get a few more seconds. Um, <laughs> uh, my PY preference is strictly through the chat. Please don't interrupt. That is all I ask. No gender pronoun preferences, say whatever. Um, just give me a few seconds to gather my notes. Starting my speech in three, two, one. Notice the intrinsic difference between positive and negative political fiction. If in positive political fiction, the agency of what can be done about your situation is placed within yourself. That is to say, the outcomes of a positive conflict, for instance, is that you end up winning. If not physically, at least you have the moral victory, which means that you earned it by doing something in terms of self-preservation or survival that they want to talk about, right? Whereas on their side of the house, imagine in 1984, the entire conclusive messaging is that you were never responsible for anything that you did because necessarily Conan at the end of the day pulls the trigger on Wilson, right? That is the conclusion that you did not have agency in all of this. And this is crucial in terms of this debate and where it is better off in terms of outcomes, right? Three questions then in this debate. Firstly, who improves the position of communities and social justice movements? Secondly, in the is the communication of hope important for people? And thirdly, in terms of where the political climate is healthier. Firstly, then in terms of who improves the position of communities within social justice movements? They have two major claims here, right? Firstly, their claim is that pessimistic fiction is effective. And secondly, that it indicates for early signs of oppression. Quickly on the second point, right? That it indicates early signs of oppression. I want to note that media has a large incentive to cover it in terms of viscerality. So this is likely to be symmetric on either side. And also the fact that social media is so globally outreaching means that this is likely to be covered in all facets on either side. The difference, however, is that people are not dumb, right? Like, you know from your lived realities that things are turning south, that certain things are getting worse off. If you're African-American, the militarization of policing within your neighborhoods is getting worse because you literally see uh, like police officers with holsters walking around your streets. That is not the difference here. The key difference is that the movie will still show a fictional reality wherein the differentiation is literally in terms of feelings as opposed to anything else that they wanted to talk about within the next speech, right? Like pushing the limits on what people feel and things as such. The differentiation in terms of movies and books and literature in general is hope and is feelings, which means that we're better off under this claim, right? But secondarily, in terms of pessimistic fiction being effective, 
notice why their claims are in contention with one another. They said that at a point in time where we portray viscerality too, that is the only lasting impression, if that is true, then this impact is literally symmetrical on both sides. But we're going to argue that having the impression of hope is something that is probably more realistic and probably something that is lasting. Why is this the case? And Rosen pointed this out. I'll expand upon it, right? It is untrue that in terms of positive portrayal, viscerality gets lost because necessarily the thought process you go through is despite facing this violence, despite facing this oppression, you as the protagonist were still able to overcome it, which means that there are instances in which the overwhelming uh, consensus is against you and still you can win out and come out on top, which is we think an important uh, message, right? But like, even if we say that, like, you know, they'll never be successful as opposition wants to point out, we think the general perception of hope itself is something that is beneficial insofar as your already pathetic life does not get even more visceral to the extent where even when you go to watch a movie for sake of entertainment or for sake of escapism, you're not berated with hopelessness and berated with nihilism and berated with an absolute sending effective. They said that it was effective insofar as it pursued the causes of survival. I want to note that in a lot of instances, survival is a positive outcome coming out of these political fictions, which means that that is a claim under our side. In 1984, if Wilson had just survived the government, that would be a positive conclusion to the book, which means that like uh, their arguments about survivability relate more to our side insofar as survivability itself is a net positive as opposed to being a dystopic portrayal of these government institutions. Before I move on, I'll take your point. Is it realistic for you to say that in every instance of state oppression, you're always going to be able to win out? Because if that's the case, your premise of hope is premised on something that will never exist in real life. Your time is over, yeah. Um, we didn't say that it is realistic. We said that having a perception of hope is generally still better off insofar as every other facet of your life is miserable. Insofar as you don't contest that claim, we still don't understand what the positive value of your case is to like the people who are living pathetic lives, right? It's like you have to work on that on off web. But thirdly, in terms of pessimistic fiction being more effective, right? Like movies are literally consumed for escapism and relaxation. Insofar as political fictions do not do this, people will move to all internet movies to watch, such as comedies and things as such, I do not understand why this is a positive shift insofar as political fictions still illustrate all of the things that they talked about in terms of like breaking the assumption of human decency and showing the possibilities of ugliness in realities while having a positive conclusion, right? Like that is a much it's much better to have these people be hopeful while watching these things as opposed to just not watching them in the first place. Second question then, is the communication of hope important to people? And I think this is where we have significant clashes in terms of what was said on either side, right? Because they said that hope is tied to outcomes insofar as survivability and other sorts of positive, positive like uh, messaging is not. I want to note, as I did earlier, that survivability is a positive outcome. But secondarily, we think we live in a status quo where you do get certain levers of structural changes occurring here and there, right? Like these are things that are emphasized by activists all over it. These are also things that are likely to be portrayed in symbolic terms in the very like political fictions that we're talking about in terms of the small concessions that you got out of governments, which, me which meant that your community could survive or even in some cases thrive. It also means that hope in terms of like what outcomes it shows you, what possibilities it shows you in future of your life, right? Because if you're an African-American who lives around in and around the ghetto, it hope is the differentiation between you joining a crime force versus you trying to pursue higher education within community colleges. This impacting is much better off under our side insofar as we get real people to go for real changes within their own lives because they think that they are the agents of changes within at least the story set within their own lives, right? This is something that they have not explained why it occurs under their side. But thirdly then, in terms of like, uh, hope and why it's important, right? They said people with social power illustrate, uh, insulate themselves from like this sort of misery, which means hope is not moving to them. I want to note that in their side of the world, in the dystopic portrayal of fiction, 
it is more likely that people who are in positions of power still feel their security because they still know the ways in which the power was consolidated in that fiction is through the very means that they have things such as money things such as political capital etc etc right so the conclusion to make here is that the communication of hope is something that is on net a positive but even if it is not even if they said that oh like desperation exists to such an extent that hope is literally a non differential we don't see why this changes under their side for like mechanisms of survivability and thriving in so far as mass media already has an incentive to cooperate up with is way too late, late to reply right but final question then in terms of political climate and i want to note that we have heard zero responses on this from the previous speaker we said that there are politicians who can weaponize the inaction of other people as opposed to pro as opposed to uh, making their own actions amplified in order to win election campaigns and things as such this is something that the democratic party has been doing for the past four election cycles right this is something that they needed to address in so far as they had to tell us why agency being ripped away from you is a positive narrative to set within the climate of political instances uh, in so far as elections can be decided on this narrative for all these reasons we are very proud to propose Okay, we thank GovWeb for a fine, very fine speech. Now let's move on to Opposition Web. He here. New web acquisition. All right, am I audible? Yes, clear and loud. I'll take POIs in the chat, so feel free to ask there. Starting in three, two, one. Kim Nepal wants to talk about changing dystopias in books, yet at the end of the bench, the only dystopia they couldn't change was the grim counterfactual they supported. The problem with the proposition case was their misunderstanding of reality, because notice their case has a very unrealistic vision of how people interact with political fiction. Their case was that once someone reads 1984, they have become so nihilistic that they give up survival. They give up self-preservation and let the government oppress you to no end. Not only is this extremely unpersuasive, it undermines their own case because it suggests that this political fiction has such massive influential power over you. The argument they accuse us of not responding to was that certain politicians have malevolent incentives to capitalize off how people act. If, we, if you believe our second argument about how these politicians are more likely to hijack the narrative of hope and people buy in towards this like without any resistance, it means that people are able to be pushed towards certain ideologies, which meant that they can so strongly force you to follow one path that in the instance where slow internal change fails, you still follow it. You don't evolve your methods, you remain complacent and ineffective. So all their arguments about proving why this is a massive cultural force ends up working for our side as well, because it shows that where you fail, it also means that you will never try anything else. Don't let get, get away with saying we didn't respond. We told you that positivity created inaction. That's why they can't say politicians will not will be inactive because their argument only talks about people on the ground, the people who read these books and there's no incentive analysis as to why politicians will react to this, but also if they're malevolent people, it feeds into our characterization of how it creates further inaction. Let's clarify the burden in the round then. The prop wanted to hinge monumental political reform on a few fictional books. And note they had to prove success because the emotion they were hinging on, which was hope, was contingent on the positive outcomes of success and second and third prop concede to this. Our burden was never to take on this huge monumental reform or the same level. What we're able to prove here is not only the people want to push towards more forms of reform, but also how that reform happens. That was something they never responded to, which means even if you believe them that they got reform, they never proved to you why how that reform happened was going to be good. There are three issues I want to talk about in this speech. First, on motivations for change. Second, on better criticisms of the state. And thirdly, on more inclusive forms of change then. 
first on motivations for change and in comparison as to why it was significantly better on the opposition. There were three categorical reasons for why hope is an unreliable and bad strategy. First, hope was contingent on positive outcomes that one day the utopic reality will eventually materialize. The problem with this was that you can lose hope, but you can never lose sight of things like survival, things like self-preservation, things like hunger, things like poverty. And this is why there are far better emotions to capitalize on when it comes to things like fear and your own protection. And the reason for this is given to you in first proposition, because they told you that things like activists burn out, which fundamentally concedes that hope can be lost, which means that hope isn't something that you rely on. Their actual burden was not to defend hope in a vacuum. It was sustained, continuous hope, which you've never been able to prove why it was always going to work. Second, hope was easily instrumentalized to downplay issues. No, there were inescapable categorical differences about how hope is portrayed in fiction. Things like individual perseverance, things like homogenous historical endpoints that move towards justice. Narratives like saying the moral arc of the universe always bends towards justice, which is a common theme in these books to catalyze that change. Or third, the things like humanization of political structures to make you feel more sympathetic or empathetic towards people in power. Third prop concedes that it's unrealistic, but this is damaging because if this fiction is so unrealistic, then you cannot apply it to yourself. You cannot see them in your shoes, which means they don't get any of their impacts then. But thirdly, we told you this from first to very little response, that hope did not matter because it was our side. The identification of issues came analytically prior. It was, the only way you're able to get change is identifying the precondition for that, which is the understanding there were issues you needed to fight for. So even if you believe they were going to fight for change on their side, it was never the most important issue. So for example, if he was fighting for an environmental cause, you will criticize that one politician that's not fighting for environmental causes rather than instead criticizing the entire system, the entire party, entire policies that not banning party hopping. That's far more likely to happen on our side because we don't lose sight of the most important things. Their only response was the matter, new matter and third prop is like, I watch comedy instead, but I don't know why that's particularly important. If it still leads to our outcomes, then it's probably something that's good. What was our comparative? Second prop makes a fatal damaging concession. They claim that anger is symmetric. But in fact, I don't think anger is symmetric. On their side, anyone who is angry is shamed or they're seen as radicalists. They're seen as anarchists because they created a social norm of optimism and complacency. So anyone who diverges from the norm is harmful. That's why our comparison of emotional motivators was better. It was not inaction. It was other powerful emotions like fear and survival and self-preservation. But then another response we want to give here is that if it's things like anger, it's who you ascribe blame towards. On our side, if we fail, that's fine because we recognize it was the state who made us into this mess. On their side, if you believe so strongly in protagonists, when your political fighters fail, when your social movements fail, you don't blame the state, you blame your social leaders because you see, you are the ones who fail. Even though it's so possible for you to get success, you fail. And that's why they get more activist burnout on their side, compounding all their harms. What's the conclusion to this issue? Not only do we prove op adds urgency to change, but prop actively reduces urgency for change by watering down the true gravity of darkness and lie to people that eventually justice will be getting. Before that, I'll take their point. Right. So we said that agency is a narrative that drives social changes. You didn't respond. Instead, you said that hope is contingent on outcomes, which we showed was realistic. Yeah, so most of these people don't believe in autonomy because if the state was so bad to them, telling them their free will isn't likely to achieve very much. Second, if you have autonomy, but that autonomy doesn't manifest successfully, there's no impact of that autonomy, which leads very nicely to the second argument about better criticisms of the state. There are three pieces of weighing here. First, this is about the process. It's very important because prop only says change will happen. That's not enough. You have to show why the change was the process, why it'll be successful. Second, prop says you have hope to fight, but we told you that hope is useless as long as you have nothing to fight for. But third, positive fiction hyperfixates on outcome, not the process. They can't claim that people learn about the journey of change because the entirety of the movie is about taking down those structures. In comparison, a pessimistic piece of fiction is more grim. It hits you deeper. It makes you reflect way more. What's the major hole in their case then? Which is about things about major activism burnout. First, if they argue there's major activist burnout, then how are they going to get any impact on their side because you have no vehicle for your change? But second, this extrapolation shows that all of their change is individualized. First, prop says they'll showcase how the protection 
antagonist succeeds, which means it's individualized even more. So therefore, it's harder for you to collectivize for these levels of change. But second, no, there was no response to our second argument about ho how hope is hijacked as a facade for sustained exploitation, where people in power are able to say, things are all right, force you to work internally within the system, do things like voting in democracy, rather than major changes to the political system, even if democracy has failed you. This is important because it meant that even if we were extremely charitable and there were symmetric incentives to improve quality of life, the categorical difference is on one end. You held onto stagnant internal change, which is far harder to get their positive outcomes. So once again, at their best, they get the same capital, but we say it because when people fundamentally think differently, we accept a diversity in thought rather than homogenizing everyone into saying we can only follow how the state wants us to do it because the state is a benevolent actor means you're far harder to get change. The third issue was about universality of this change. We explained from second op that their hope and their mechanisms were exclusionary. We bridged this gap because pessimism was immediately a narrative that was more inclusive of everyone, the lower class, the ethnic minority, the proletariat, but also affected the people at the top because they finally felt they had hope and they had, they had these forms of like harm towards them, which is their fear and their survival. Third prop concedes to this, but they also had no response, which means this argument is still standing. Take off your rose tinted lenses. Let's call it for what it is. It's not optimistic political fiction. It killed the only tool the politically disillusioned have to need the torch for change. We are exceedingly proud to oppose. Okay, uh, we thank Albert for a very fine speech. Now let's move on to invite opposition reply. Here, here. Hi, can I be heard? Yes. All right. Uh, can you be a little bit louder? I think your, your voice sounds a little bit distant. All right, sure. I'll speak a bit louder. Starting my speech in three, two, one. Proposition needs to understand the definition of fiction. It means that political fiction is not a play-by-play -play of the present. It means that status quo boasts zero Aurelian governmental structures, but we can warn society to fear the early warning signs so as to not degrade into that kind of reality. Why is this misunderstanding of the context crucial? For two reasons. Number one, because this engages in proposition's best case. Even if we are utterly hopeless in our media, it is not the status quo. It means you have to take action now to prevent the future of hopelessness. But second, it means proposition cannot co-opt agency, and agency is only empowered insofar as the pathway is a realistic one. We must highlight the barriers to agency before we can fight them. Proposition tells you you are free when ultimately you are not. Two issues then to talk about in this speech. Firstly, on who gets a stronger opposition to the overwhelming state authority, and secondly, on society, which talks about other stakeholders outside the oppressed and outside activists. Firstly then, on autonomy and how you are able to hold the state accountable. Four things broadly. Number one, we tell you that from the start, our first argument already implicitly dealt with everything about activist burnout. Why is this the case? Because proposition tells you we have no hope to fight, but we are telling you that people don't know that they have to fight until it is too late. We told you also that hope is unimportant insofar as people fight for their survival, not for happy moments, which means that our analysis is unique and exclusive insofar as we get hope as well. But secondly, the burden that proposition takes onto themselves is to prove social change exists. But how? Because when people don't even recognize the severity of the situation they are in, proposition cannot co-op this kind of anger. Proposition also cannot co-op the depictions of viscerality because we think it's important that propositions, the third proposition speech already concedes the importance of the illustration of the propensity of harm when they say that there are other avenues to achieve this kind of viscerality. We told you no. We told you three structural reasons they have still been unengaged with, which means that all they have is assertions. We told you, number one, it's about the people outside the political sphere to increase mobilization and increase awareness. We told you, two, it's about a political nature to unite against the oppressors, we told you three, that films exist in an alternative world, which means it's much clearer than political analysis and newsfeed. It is only here you're able to visualize what's going to happen, meaning that only on our side of the house we get that on our, uh, that kind of engagement. But lastly, what is else is unengaged? We told you the structural reasons of optimism bias and why that only happens under our side of the house, that we're only able to defeat them. We told you about the optimism bias, a chronic lack in imagination. Check your notes panel. It is Nepal that has been unengaging in this debate and parallel when it comes to engagement. Why is this important? 
important then because we think on proposition by the time you're even able to get out of your your privileged bubble you're unable to act anymore because there's no more there's no more agency left for you to exercise under our side of the house we think this is crucial insofar as we're able to, we're able to inform people notice that proposition cannot say that we're going to have a terrible circumstance and also have hope because that is unrealistic they have to choose one either they have a realistic depiction of some hope and activists in status quo so people actually relate to it and therefore they attain the benefits of hope or they have a very unrealistic representation and that is only where you can depict the visceralities of government imposition that only we get to claim meaning that we exclusively protect people against the most oppressive and worst kinds of governments but secondly let's talk about society and the stakeholders outside activists number one third proposition's case shift to say that the political value of entertainment is just to be an escapist form already is damning for their entire case because if the politics is unimportant in entertainment then why did proposition waste 16 minutes of speech telling you about how the media is going to fix activists and help them like achieve political change right meaning that they have to concede and third proposition speech was unimportant in this debate but secondly there was no response to the third argument under our side of the house we told you about why oppression uniquely from the state and this is where we're more nuanced in our, our analysis that the state's oppression is one that uniquely affects everybody but it is for the most privileged who have never been able to conceptualize what oppression means they are unable to be mobilized we told since proposition tells you that mobilization is crucial to social change we are ultimately able to co-op that insofar as the insofar as we assume most people become aware of the issues they have to be fighting for proposition tells you you cannot fight we tell you you don't know you have to fight we come we are the prerequisite to proposition's case we oppose We thank opposition reply for a very fine speech. Now let's move on to invite the last speaker to conclude the entire debate. Thank you. Okay. Are we starting our speech in three? Two, one. Four strategic flaws that side opposition made in this debate. Firstly, their case is entirely based on dis desperation and anger that really points out, but they re don't really materialize on what sort of impact that comes or change that comes in society in general. We don't think, we tell you how survival is something that's symmetric on either side. Hope is something that's unique. But secondly, they literally strawman our case on like nihilism when they say that, oh, like just just because of political fiction, there is no nihilism that really exists. But understand here, nihilism is something that's a major rhetoric of pop culture in everyday life. This is something we have pointed out from our first speech. It's not just this political fiction, but there are multiple other narratives in society that literally propagates nihilism to a greater extent, that promotes nihilism and you know hopelessness amongst people in general. But thirdly, uh, uh, their their entire time, uh, their entire point on like how uh, how negative watching negative fiction literally leads them to like uh, literally leads them to like uh, probably uh, how the entire point of how watching negative fiction leads them to like going uh, leads them to like changing things and th things as such, right? There is a massive logical gap there. We don't know how they're able to solve it. But fourthly. They say that state is something that's benevolent and uh, and something that's not supposed to be uh, supposed to be questioned, especially because they are working in their first speech and in their third speech they go uh, go and say that you know we should not uh, we should these states should be responsible instead of individuals. There's a huge contradiction in general. Three things to why we win this debate. Firstly, on effectiveness of urgency. Thirdly, on community, secondly, on communities, and thirdly, on political inactions and climate in general, right? Firstly, on effectiveness. We tell you that hope is something that's extremely important under our side. They tell us that survival, ho survival and hopelessness is an instinct that guides these individuals in order to work, right? What we need to understand is that if there are a mechanism to why hope does not work is something that's, oh, it's only like something that's uh, going to be short term, understand that things like fair are also short term or things like survival needs are also short term to, to a massive, uh, to a massive, uh, massive amount of cases, especially because 
uh, they have to let go. But even when, let's say, there is something that's long lasting, the need to actually feel hopeless and not do anything is why is it not overwhelming over the need to actually bring change and things as such? They never prove to us why that happens. We tell you that hope is unique under our side, specifically because of the fact that we are able to actually materialize these sort of incentives in different ways. We tell you that urgency and the fact that you know problems generally exist in society and are propagated by activists, because even in the absence of these fiction, there are going to be other mechanisms in society that are still going to be present, because of which there is still a sense of urgency that people feel in general. This literally means that the distinction of optimism is massively important to bring that form of hope, and that's going to be more effective. But we also talk about how activism burnout how activism burnout is something that's like uh, that's like massively occurs on, under their side, specifically when hopelessness is an increasing tendency. Under our side, this burnout is less likely to occur, specifically because they're hopeful about the future. We think that's massively important because that's what people like activists are facing right now because of the massive tendency of like believing that there is hopelessness in general. But secondly, on community, we tell you why agency of individuals is something that we're able to prioritize agency to bring change and all of these things that's likely to happen. But we also tell you that there is an intrinsic form of solidarity within the community because there is no internal conflict and things as such. It's like massively important. The point to state is failure. We, um, we basically show a better form of so solvency. But thirdly, on political inaction, we tell you why this inaction is massively likely under status quo and things as such. But uh, it's like less likely under our world when we are able to question the state or uh, other mechanisms for these reasons. For all those reasons, we are very proud to stand on top of this. Thank you.